All right, welcome everyone. Craig here from the Prehab Guys. We got another awesome podcast lined up for you. Everything that you need to know about cortisone shots with Dr. Alex Weber. Dr. Alex Weber is no stranger to the podcast. If you've been following our podcast for some time, you would recognize his name because he's actually one of the first surgeons that we interviewed for our podcast. So if you haven't listened to that, give that a listen. I believe it's episode seven or eight. It's talking about shoulders with Dr. Alex Weber. Alex is a great surgeon. He's a really good physician. He is local in Los Angeles as well. I refer patients to him all the time. He refers patients to me and I don't have enough good things to say about him. He's by the books, he's by the evidence, uh, but he has great bedside manner. He's very easy to speak to and he's on top of his game. And he's gonna get you educated in regards to everything that you need to know about cortisone shots. So all the time when the three of us are in the clinic, there's a lot of misconceptions about cortisone shots. People think that they're getting one thing or people think that they're getting another. They think that cortisone shots are going to do X, Y, and Z and that they can just get them anywhere. Uh, But that is definitely not the case. And I I think that you're going to learn a lot in this podcast about maybe what we need to be pushing the envelope towards in in terms of maybe taking a step back from cortisone shots and considering other biological solutions if we're talking about injections or orals for that matter. So Dr. Weber talks about some really interesting stuff, especially the rotator cuff. I remember he mentioned this study a couple years ago at USC Shoulder Day. And I was like, wow, that, that's a staggering statistic. So it's really interesting. Also, Dr. Weber and I, we were chatting before and after the podcast. And one thing that we didn't talk about during this podcast was, was tendons. And if you are getting cortisone shots into tendons or that is what you're considering, that is what you have been offered, do not do it. There, you should never get a cortisone shot injected directly into a tendon. It just has bad news written all over it. We talked about how we can do injections maybe relative and close to the area to let that cortisone bathe the tendon if it's really hot and fired up. But the more evidence that comes out about managing tendinopathies, the more that we know that cortisone is just not good for tendons. So, and we started going on a rant together talking about tennis elbow. And that is one of the hardest things for us to treat after someone has gotten a cortisone shot into their tennis elbow. So definitely hold off on cortisone shots and tendons, but otherwise, hang tight. This is a really good podcast. We dive into some unique topics. We talk about what are the options and what are the typical path of cares for the average person as well as the athletes. Dr. Weber is a team physician for the Kings as well as the USC Trojans. So he has some really good insight as well as he practices in the greater Los Angeles area, and he's able to pull insight from both uh, from both dimensions. All right, so without further ado. The Prehab Audio Experience will teach you how to take control of your health through knowledge by optimizing performance, promoting longevity, and keeping your movement system in tune. Welcome to your host, the Prehab Guys. Today, we have Dr. Alex Weber, an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist. Dr. Weber serves as a team physician for the USC Trojans and the Los Angeles Kings. He is also an assistant professor of sports medicine in the USC Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Dr. Weber is also currently engaged in clinical and basic science research for topics that involve evaluating sports medicine injuries, as well as arthritis. Alex, it's an honor to have you join the show again. Thank you. Craig, thanks uh, for having me. I, I love being here with you and looking forward to a fun session today. Yeah, so Alex, uh, it's funny because for the podcast, I want to call you Dr. Weber, but Alex, we've been working together for a little over two years now. It's always great to connect with surgeons on our podcast uh, that I also work with in person as we refer patients to one another. And Alex is 
no stranger to the show. He was actually one of our very first podcasts over a year ago. And uh, today Mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about a really cool topic that I think there is so much misinformation out there as well as just not enough education when it comes to everything you need to know about cortisone shots. I completely agree, Craig. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. I'd also say that even when we do have the correct information, we don't have enough. So this should be a fun uh, talk today. And uh, we'll try to fill in some of the gaps in the misinformation. And then I'll I'll try to highlight some of the areas where we're still doing research and still trying to learn more about corticosteroid injections. I have a solid feeling that I am going to learn a lot from this podcast as well, because this is this is one of those things that you you're not going to learn a ton about in PT school. You're going to have to you're going to have to go out and search it. You're going to have to learn on your own. So I'm pretty excited for it. So let's jump right into it. What exactly are what exactly are cortisone shots? Let's define the terminology. Let's better educate the public because you and I, we spoke about this before. Not all injections are equivalent. Yes, 100%. So um, let me first define corticosteroids and then we'll put it into the framework of what, what are the things being injected into patients in this day and age. So corticosteroid injections uh, fall into a category of um, glucocorticoids, which is the name or nomenclature for cortisol, which is uh, produced uh, in the adrenal gland naturally. And cortisol is a very strong anti-inflammatory. Uh, and then corticosteroid injections or cortisone are the synthetic or man-made versions of cortisol, uh, which again are strong anti-inflammatories. They come in a variety of uh, dosages or strengths, and we use them uh, as basically a surrogate for the naturally occurring cortisol, and it can come in multiple forms. So currently we use uh, oral a cortisone, topical cortisones, inhaled versions, and injected versions. Um, so that's really the background of, of what our corticosteroids or cortisone are uh, and their applications. We can talk a little bit more about where we use them orally, where we use them topically, where they use in an inhaled form, and then probably for the orthopedic surgeon, the physical therapist, the athletic trainer, the place where we're most familiar with them in use is the injectable uh, form. Yeah. So let's transition right into that. You know, I would love to hear how do you typically use them and prescribe them on a daily or weekly basis in your practice? Sure. Sure. So uh, I'll start with the ones that we don't use frequently. So in, in my current practice, the topical uh, forms and the inhaled forms uh, we typically don't use. Um, topicals can be helpful. Uh, they just don't seem to be in a large part of my practice. Uh, inhaleds are typically the, uh, for used for those with asthma. I should mention the topicals are typically used uh, for more uh, autoimmune conditions, uh, the psoriasis or uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, things that have some skin component, dermatitis, et cetera. Uh, in the oral form, I do think there's a role uh, for the musculoskeletal patient. The places I probably use the oral form the most is in the um, Medrol dose pack, with Medrol being one of the uh, corticosteroid types. Uh, and we use that for adhesive capsulitis, so frozen shoulder. I think it can be a great uh, medication to help decrease acute inflammation um, uh, related to the frozen shoulder and allow the patient to get into physical therapy or start working on motion. Um, Anywhere where there's acute inflammation, the Medrol dose pack can be helpful. Uh, So there are other times with flares of arthritis, um, flares of lower back pain, where the Medrol dose pack or oral steroid can be helpful. Again, um, with uh, the caveats that we'll discuss in a little bit about pros and cons of using uh, steroids and some of the side effect profile of steroids. Um, And I mentioned lower backs. I think in in my uh, clinical practice uh, and also sometimes with our 
athletes um, for an acute flare of lower back pain um, or an acute flare of pain, uh, sometimes the oral steroid can be helpful. Probably yeah, and the largest. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention the oral stuff. You know, that was something that I was not aware of until I started working mm -hmm. with you. And, you know, my wife, she's also a physical therapist that you work with as well. We've, we've seen frozen shoulder patients from you. And that was the first time that we ever heard about the oral dose. And we've seen great stuff mm -hmm. with it. And I, you know, I had my thoughts as to why you would go with the oral versus the injections. But I would love to hear, you know, whether you can finish your phrase. I know it cut you off a little bit yeah. or we can transition to that in a bit. I, th I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, so let's stick with the oral for now, and then we'll go on to the injectable stuff. I think um, uh, there is a role, like you mentioned. I'm glad you're seeing good results with it. I think I I would say the same. You know, the, the things I mentioned to patients are um, uh, that you want to start with the simplest stuff first and then move on to the more complex treatments. Mm -hmm. And I think when someone comes to see me for the first or second time with frozen shoulder, I think we both know and a lot of the therapists uh, and athletic trainers out there know that uh, adhesive capsules or frozen shoulder can be a really difficult uh, um, disease entity to treat. So, um, you know, I like to have multiple options for these patients. And I think starting with the simple stuff first or the least invasive stuff first makes the most sense. Uh, so if someone comes to me and they're in a lot of pain, I'll start with uh, the Medrol dose pack because I know it can predictably decrease uh, pain and inflammation related to that shoulder and allow them to be more functional in physical therapy. I think from a um, surgeon uh, perspective or, or a physician perspective, I think it's always good to have uh, extra treatments in your back pocket, so to speak, or that yeah. silver bullet if you need it. And that's where I think sometimes the injection of corticosteroid comes into play. So if you burn all your bridges up front, it's hard when the patient comes back in six weeks or eight weeks and says, listen, like I, I did well with the cortisone injection for X period of time, but I'm back in a bad spot. What can you give me now? And we'll talk about not doing multiple injections in multiple locations and some of the pros and cons of timing of cortisone injections. So I like to save some uh, treatment options for later down the pathway when needed. So yeah, that, the oral that is a great sense. option up front. Yeah. Especially too, um, when someone comes into the clinic, the shoulder is just, it's on fire. It's hurting. Uh, not everyone is going to be, arms wide open, welcome to getting a big needle stuck in their arm, especially in a right. very painful shoulder. So I think it's, that's a great entrance to treatment uh, versus, like you said, using some of the, the bigger, heavier guns when needed. Yep. So I think um, it's probably the area I use it the most. Occasionally someone will have um, uh, an arthritic flare in a shoulder or knee hip that I think a Medrol dose pack can be helpful for. Uh, lower back pain, same thing, uh, degenerative lower back pain, uh, the Medrol dose pack or neck pain can be very helpful. Uh, again, we talk about the pros and cons, uh, oral uh, corticosteroids do have some systemic effects. So we talk about increasing blood sugar, uh, for a few days, some people get hyperactive, increase in appetite, some weight gain. So we always have those conversations, but I think overwhelmingly for short periods of time, a Medrol dose pack is a really great way to decrease acute inflammation related to some of the musculoskeletal conditions. And now let's transition into the injections. Let's talk about how sure. you use them in your practice whether it's yep. the, the, general, the general population as well as we mentioned in, in the beginning that you are a team physician for the USC Trojans as well as the LA Kings. And I'm a huge hockey fan, so I'm super excited to hear that you've taken on that role. Uh, but also at the same time, because I love hockey so much and I've, spe uh, and I've spoken to people that have worked in that industry like when it's when it's in the middle of a game and, and guys get injured, there's a lot, the NHL as well as the NFL 
that is where some of these treatments, they can really come into play, especially if guys need to get back into stuff. So I'd love to hear how the dynamics are different for both populations. Yeah. So um, I think it's a great question. Let's start with just the general population that comes to see me in the office and how we use uh, corticosteroid injections. And then we'll talk about the athlete as well. Um, so I think probably one of the most commonly asked questions is with regards to cortisone steroid uh, use in the knee or injections in the knee when it comes to either meniscus tears or osteoarthritis in the knee. And uh, what I will tell you is when it comes to the knee, we frequently will see the patient anywhere from 45 to 75 who has a, a meniscus injury and maybe some early arthritic change in their knee. And then maybe they're coming for a second or a third opinion. One surgeon has told them they need to have an arthroscopic procedure to have a partial meniscectomy. Another has offered them some type of injection and they're coming for some clarification. And I, I think one of the most important things for this patient is having that shock absorber, that meniscus in the knee is better than not having the shock absorber in the knee. So we really, the pendulum has swung to where we're really trying to preserve the meniscus mm -hmm. in that patient's knee. Uh, and when that's the case, um, we talk about injections. We talk about orthobiologic injections, whether that be uh, platelet rich plasma, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which are great anti inflammatories. Uh, and we talk about cortisone injections. And for a lot of patients, uh, you know, the conversation centers around price, um, affordability. And right now, unfortunately, the platelet rich plasma injections or the orthobiologics are not covered by insurance. So, what it boils down to is I typically say, let's try one cortisone injection, it's covered by insurance. Uh, and for the vast majority of patients in that setting with a non-displaced meniscus tear, uh, one cortisone injection and some really good physical therapy for six to 12 weeks. And the vast majority of patients, their symptoms are gone, they're fully functional and they're back to activities. So uh, I think in that group or that population, uh, one cortisone injection is a very powerful treatment when coupled with really good physical therapy. And I, I bet a lot of that session is just education because for the Absolutely. most part, people are going to come in and all they're going to associate their pain with is this idea that this tear happened, that tear is there and that's causing the pain. But I always like to educate people that basically the equilibrium in your knee has been thrown off and uh, there's this cascade of events including a lot of this inflammation and that's what's causing a ton of pain and sensitivity. And that's where these, and I love, I love that the pendulum is swayed to let's keep that shock absorber because we know the detrimental effects that can occur if that gets taken out over the years. But I'm curious Absolutely. if you had it your way and insurance companies were not the limiting factor Say that someone came in the same demographics that you described. What would be your ideal first line of treatment? If we're talking about injections, would it be PRP? Uh, would it be the cortisone, the corticosteroid shot, or would it be a different yeah. biological solution? Yeah, that's a great question. I I really think um, in my mind, uh, and it speaks to how we're now treating our athletes, whether it be USC athletes or the LA Kings or or, or anyone for that matter, professional or high level athlete, um, we're really moving uh, more into the orthobiologics. So platelet rich plasma, bone marrow aspirate, stromal vascular fraction, which is um, taken from uh, adipose tissue in the body. And the reason for that is we're getting the anti inflammatory properties of those injections, a strong localized anti inflammatory properties and we're not seeing the detrimental side effects that we do see with cortisone so in the high level young athlete we're really uh, trying to minimize the amount of cortisone we're using and maximize some of these other uh, anti-inflammatory injections uh, which uh, for 
better or worse, sometimes we can't give to uh, patients in the office because of insurance obstacles. But mm-hmm. uh, platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow aspirate, stromal vascular fraction, uh, these injectables uh, have a, a, a very, very strong local anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, and we don't see uh, the degradation of cartilage, tendon, ligament um, that we do with uh, cortisone. Uh, having said that, in the athlete, there is still a, a very limited role for cortisone. Um, you know, it's not used, we don't use it at, in an in-game scenario. Um, you know, most of the time in, in, in-game scenarios, it's oral anti-inflammatory, uh, ice between uh, periods or heat, um, manual manipulation, uh, things of that nature. Um, That's good. But, it's um, good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the days of shoot them up and put them back in are have come to an end. You know, we're, we're really looking to protect our, our athletes uh, for the long haul um, and for their longevity. Uh, and most of the time with a good manual treatment, some oral anti-inflammatory, uh, ice, heat, um, manipulation, uh, and adrenaline from the athlete. Um, yeah. If it's safe to go to go back in, the athletes are ready and willing uh, to participate. Um, but the the cortisone, the the fraction of athletes treated with uh, cortisone has really diminished. I think over time, as we learn more about the orthobiologics. And would you say that that's just because these biologics that you guys are using now? Are they just less synthetic? You know, it's more, it has more endogenous properties where you guys are taking stuff from that person's body versus, you know, like we spoke about earlier, the, the corticosteroid injections are definitely mm-hmm. more synthetic. Yeah, absolutely. So all of the orthobiologics uh, come from the patient. So it's their natural anti-inflammatory properties there's nothing added and there are no additives from the outside world. So you're getting really a natural uh, anti-inflammatory that's um, taken from the patient and injected back into the area where that anti-inflammatory is needed most. And I think, you know, I know you spoke uh, with, with Jorge and, and Nick about some orthobiologics, but that field is evolving so quickly that mm-hmm. that could be, you know, an opportunity to have another, um, a podcast in the future, maybe of how we're applying orthobiologics uh, to the high level collegiate and professional athlete. Yeah. Um, I mean, even since we spoke to them, I'm sure that so much has changed and yeah. there's been so much research that has been published updating, yep. uh, you know, the best, the best practice guidelines. You know, one area, uh, one other area where I think it's worth mentioning uh, cortisone injections in the general population uh, is when it comes to uh, shoulder impingement, rotator cuff partial tears, uh, and full thickness rotator cuff tears. So I think um, this is an area which is near and dear to me because we've done some really good research at USC in this area, uh, and we continue to do some really good research, I think, about corticosteroids and, and rotator cuff tears. Um, but we see a lot of patients who come in with an inflamed shoulder due to impingement and potentially some bursitis, partial tearing of the rotator cuff. And uh, these patients do tend to do quite well with a one-time cortisone injection and physical therapy. Um, Where I start to be a little hesitant to inject uh, shoulders is when there's a full thickness rotator cuff tear. And the reason for that is a, a study which uh, we published last year and has uh, garnered some attention in our world is um, looking at the retear rates or the reoperation rates after a rotator cuff repair if the patient had a cortisone injection prior to surgery. So we we looked at about uh, twenty thousand rotator cuff repairs done in this country, and we match them to twenty thousand rotator cuff repairs done in this country where an injection of cortisone had been uh, done prior to the surgery, at least one injection. And what we found is that the rotator cuff reoperation rate or needing a revision rotator cuff repair 
uh, was significantly higher if you've had one or more cortisone injections prior to your surgery. And more so, what we found is that as the number of injections increased prior to your rotator cuff repair, or as the time between the injection and the rotator cuff repair decreased, so an injection right before your surgery, your chances of needing a revision rotator cuff repair were much higher. So what this tells us is that there are truly detrimental effects to muscle and tendon from cortisone injections. And it really gives uh, surgeons and clinicians, for that matter, some pause about who we're injecting and why we're injecting them. Yep. So, yeah, I think, like I said, I think the algorithm for me is if it's bursitis or shoulder impingement and an intact cuff, I'm pretty okay or inclined to give that person a a one-time cortisone injection and physical therapy. And the vast majority of those patients get better and go back to life uh, as they were uh, healthy and happy. If it's a partial tear, we have this conversation uh, about pros and cons of orthobiologics versus cortisone uh, versus physical therapy alone. Uh, And if it's a full thickness tear in a young active patient, young meaning anywhere from 40 to 70 or maybe even 75, if the muscle tendon quality look good, I'm more inclined to tell that patient uh, about this study we did and say, listen, if you're really hell bent on having a cortisone injection and physical therapy, um, you know, I can provide that if you're really strongly set on that. But my preference would be let's try physical therapy first. And after six or 12 weeks, if you're not where you need to be, then we're, we're probably going to skip the cortisone injection and go to a arthroscopic rotator cuff repair because I want to give you the best chance of healing uh, and not needing a revision surgery. And then yeah. on the far end of the spectrum is the patient who's probably 75 or above who already has some degenerative changes to the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint. So if there's arthritis already in the joint, um, that patient is probably going to have a reverse shoulder replacement rather than a rotator cuff repair. Mm -hmm. And when that's the case, um, I'm more willing to give them cortisone injections every four to six months for as long as that treatment algorithm is working for them. Because at the end of the day, instead of trying to repair that native tendon, we're going to put in a reverse shoulder replacement. um, and, And that doesn't require any rotator cuff healing. So I feel comfortable that cortisone injections can treat that patient for a period of time. And ultimately, they'll have a shoulder replacement rather than needing any type of muscle and tendon repair. I remember you presenting that stuff at USC Shoulder Day. I guess it was probably Mm -hmm. two years ago at this time. Yeah. And then I found myself just asking every single rotator cuff repair surgery that I saw or anyone rotator cuff related, I was like, Hey, have you ever gotten a core, a uh, core zone shot? Yeah. And then, and then yeah. it was just, it was like, Oh man, it, it just had you nerve wracked, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I, I'll be honest, I've lost some patients over this before because I really truly believe in this data. And now there's been three or four additional studies which have shown the same thing or almost exactly the same thing. And so I, I truly believe in this. And some patients come to me and they say, listen, doc, I really just want the temporary relief of a cortisone injection. I don't want to have the surgery. And um, I'm, I'm actually willing to tell those patients about this. And if they choose that they really want to have the cortisone injection, I sometimes will let them go to elsewhere because yeah. someone's going to have to repair that rotator cuff at some point. And um, it's, it's unfortunately, based on the data, it's probably not going to go very well. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, I firmly believe in this, and it speaks to some of the detrimental effects that we're seeing with cortisone injections or repeat cortisone injections. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's really what pushes us into this uh, conversation about orthobiologics and using some other type of anti-inflammatory injections. Uh, that don't carry the same detrimental effects of uh, cortisone injection. So let's transition into that because you had brought up the scenario of working with someone who is more than likely, if they're bound to have a surgery, it's going to be a joint replacement. 
and you're not too worried about how many repeated cortisone uh, injection treatments you're going to do with that person. However, is there ultimately a shelf life with how many cortisone shots you feel comfortable giving to someone? I would love for you to yeah. run through a few different scenarios of this is how many I would, I would use in my practice or you know, for, for a shoulder in this scenario, we're okay with X amount, but then once we hit a threshold, that's when we need to consider other alternatives and solutions. Yeah, I think um, it's a really good uh, question, Craig, and it really speaks to, um, you know, having some uh, pre-treatment conversations with your patients because every patient has different goals uh, for their treatment. And, um, you know, I think a good clinician or surgeon talks to the patient about their goals before starting treatment and then tailors the treatment uh, algorithm uh, to those goals. And when I say that, I mean, uh, some patients come with degenerative changes in their shoulder or knee, and they say, listen, doc, I don't wanna do anything surgically for five years. And I know I have degenerative changes already, but let's do everything under the sun to keep me active and functional and in as little pain as possible until it's time for a knee or shoulder replacement uh, or hip replacement or whatever the joint may be. And we have conversations about the pros and cons of different injections, cortisone, hyaluronic acid or lubricating injections uh, and orthobiologics. And then we make a plan that works for them. And, and I have some patients who come to me every six months uh, get a cortisone injection and feel great for six months. Uh, and, you know, I see them twice a year and that's their treatment plan. And, and that may be indefinite for them. And those patients uh, likely had arthritis when they came to see me the first time, weren't ready for any type of arthroplasty or joint replacement. And for them, that treatment algorithm works. Uh, not every patient gets six months of relief from a cortisone injection. And we do know that there's some um, uh, there's some uh, effects of cortisone which uh, uh, cause uh, shorter durations of uh, symptom relief over time, or there's limited benefits uh, with each injection. So um, for those patients that get six months of relief every time, you feel fortunate to have some of those in your practice because there are others that get a few weeks of relief. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then certainly multiple cortisone injections is not an option because we know that there is a dose and frequency dependent adverse uh, effects from these injections. So, you know, I feel comfortable giving them every four to six months to patients who know that they have some, uh, that it will de degenerate their cartilage further, but that's going to be their treatment option for a long period of time. You know, I think, um, uh, there are a number of studies now that show that increased cortisone injections uh, do diminish cartilage in the joint or cause the cartilage to thin over time. Mm -hmm. So these patients need to know ahead of time that they're trending towards a joint replacement. They also need to know that uh, it needs to be at least three months between their last injection and their time of joint replacement uh, because there are studies that show there's an uh, increased complication rate if you have injections close to the time of your uh, joint replacement. So three months is the minimum. You know, some surgeons uh, prefer six months between uh, time of last injection and uh, joint replacement. Interesting. So, what, are some, what are some of those side effects or some of those uh, risks? Is that better? Yeah. Better what is risk? Yeah. So there's, a, um, there's some studies in the joint replacement world uh, looking at uh, need for revision surgery uh, complications such as infection uh, related to the joint replacement, and those seem to be higher if the patients have had cortisone injections uh, close to the time of surgery. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where it gets tricky, uh, but I'm totally in the same boat as you, where we want to give people, we want to we want to make better informed decisions based off of data and research, and. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, uh, pain and short-term relief 
and uh, delay gratification, they don't always line up with the data. And mm -hmm. it can be really hard when you have that person sitting in front of you and they want to get out of pain or they want that short-term relief, uh, but they're not setting themselves up for the long run. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's really respectable that you're okay with people, you know, walking out the door and going in the opposite direction because ultimately if that person needs to get surgery, like you said, next thing you know, your name is attached to that cortisone injection and that surgeon is going to be like, well, if he is going off of the best evidence-based practice and guidelines, why, why did he do that? Yeah, I think, you know, it's all about communicating with the patients, letting them know what uh, the data show uh, or what the data are. And then, like you said, um, you know, you, you have to feel comfortable with what you're doing. And, and I always tell patients, like I try to treat my patients like I treat my family or myself. And, mm -hmm. um, this is what I'm comfortable doing. And if it doesn't align with what you're comfortable doing, I, there are a lot of really great surgeons in this town and I, I always am happy to provide a, a referral. Yeah. So I think a good place now to transition is let's talk about alternatives. So we've discussed biological solutions, which I'm sure hopefully in a matter of a decade, insurance companies buy into this stuff and it mm -hmm. only leads to just better treatment, uh, better treatment solutions for everyone uh, because we know that we're using it in sports medicine and you guys are clearly seeing the benefits, uh, but mm -hmm. it's still not, 100% readily available and affordable to the general population. So yep. then what's the next tier of alternatives that you mm -hmm. use in your practice and that you recommend to your patients? It's a great question. I think the big mainstays uh, for me are the uh, cortisone injections and the orthobiologics. And uh, to your point, I think over the next 10 years, the, the impetus is really on the clinicians to do the research and not just inject these things, but study how these injections are providing symptom relief, how they're potentially changing uh, the cascade of events for that joint. Is it halting the progression of arthritis? Is it helping uh, heal tissue? Um, so these things need to be studied by the clinicians. We also need to look at how these orthobiologics are prepared uh, because not every preparation of a platelet-rich plasma or uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate are the same. So we need to do these studies and we need to show or demonstrate to the insurance companies that these other alternatives uh, are equivalent to or better than cortisone. and once those studies are done, uh, then it's very hard for the insurance companies to not provide reimbursement uh, yeah. for these injections. And then the other categories are big categories. Some people uh, inject uh, strong anti-inflammatories into joints like uh, Toradol um, and uh, hyaluronic acid or joint lubricating injections are another uh, big category of injectables and i think that um the, the data are mixed on hyaluronic acid uh, some patients get great uh, pain relief from a lubricating type injection and others get no relief um, yeah. you know we've seen and now there's some uh, data published uh, studies on the combination of uh, the lubricating injections hyaluronic acid and platelet-rich plasma uh, together. And I think that's a powerful combination. And that's actually one that I like to use in the athletes um, uh, who have some inflammatory joint issue or a cartilage injury in the knee or shoulder. Um, the combination of the two, a strong anti-inflammatory without the detrimental effects of cortisone uh, plus a lubricating injection, hyaluronic acid uh, can be a, a great combination for those athletes. Yeah, I can see that being pretty nice because I'm sure that there has to be some sort of interaction with the, with the strong anti-inflammatory properties and maybe some of the synovial joint fluid, depending what joint you're injecting. So that just, that sounds like a nice little cocktail for the joint for a, yep. uh, not a cocktail, let's call it a, a healthy yeah. smoothie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it is. I, I think we're, 
we're starting to study that in our USC athletes. And I think that combination uh, will be used more frequently, you know, starting with uh, athletes, but hopefully moving into uh, the everyday patient who comes into the office too. And again, I think that's really on us as a medical uh, group to study these things and publish our results and, um, you know, provide the evidence to support using them uh, and insurance companies reimbursing for them. Yeah. And, you know, as a team physician, you have a lot more resources, which is super exciting because I'm sure that you guys just get to, you know, do, do before and after imaging or, and mm-hmm. just the more clinical testing that you guys can do to see, okay, how, what is the effect of this injection or this oral on this joint and on this tissue? And how did that joint last over the four years while this student athlete was with us or while this player was with us? So you guys yeah, are leading a, the way and it's, it's very exciting. It's actually um, not to give away all our, our secrets here, but USC uh, has one of the few uh, seven Tesla MRIs in the country. Um, there, I think there are only three or four MRIs of that uh, magnitude. Um, in the US and we have wow. one at USC for clinical use. And um, that's one of the things we're embarking on right now is looking at um, over the course of three or four years for some of our athletes who potentially leave early, what are the ramifications of training at this high a level? Mm-hmm. What does that do to your cartilage um, in your knees, for example? over four years of jumping or four years of running. Um, and can we see changes in those joints uh, with a very uh, strong resolution MRI, such as a 70, seven Tesla MRI. So you bring up good points and we're very fortunate to be on uh, the forefront of some of this research, but I think it really helps provide data you know these athletes these uh, college athletes are uh, sacrificing a lot in terms of social life and physical well-being sometimes Mm -hmm. and to do uh, the sport that uh, they're uh, brought to usc to do and to be able to study that and give them some data and say listen you know it's safe to do all this running and jumping because we don't see significant cartilage changes over three or four years um, I think is is powerful and and helps put their minds at ease. So yeah. we're we're looking forward to getting some of that data out. It's exciting. Well, Alex, this has been information packed. I know everyone is going to Thanks. absolutely love this. I've learned a lot. I, I knew that I would learn a lot. Is there anything else that you would that you would like to share that you would want to you know clear clear the air about in regards to? cortisone shots this is a I think this is a great opportunity to share that i think this was awesome i really appreciate the opportunity craig and you know i think the take home points are uh it's important for clinicians to really talk uh with their patients make a treatment plan ahead of time so everyone's on the same page from the jump and know that uh, there are roles for cortisone injections uh knowing the side effect profiles ahead of time and that uh, there are side effects which are frequency and dose dependent. So use cortisone injections sparingly. And before you get any, ask about the uh, other options like hyaluronic acid and orthobiologics. So I think with that in mind, you know, all the physical therapists, athletic trainers, patients out there who are listening uh, will do very well. Yeah, I quoted you before this podcast because I I definitely had to bring this up, but you said it best. The provider and the patient need to know exactly what they are giving and what they are getting into. Exactly. Yeah, well said. All right, Alex. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, thank you. And uh, this was great. That was such an awesome podcast with Alex. That was packed with so much education and information. I think a lot of people can walk away from this podcast feeling more informed they feel better and in more control of their own health because now they have a better idea as to should they get a cortisone shot or should they consider something else 
ultimately that is that is what we want people to walk away with with these podcasts is education to make better informed decisions about your own health if you enjoyed this podcast please rate review and subscribe to our podcast your comments your thumbs up your suggestions mean the world to us more importantly if you're giving this a listen please tag us uh take a screenshot tag us on social media tag dr weber he's active on social media he would love it tag us share it get the word out because people need to know this stuff about cortisone shots what was the regular practice maybe a few years ago even or even five ten years ago so much has changed and we've learned from mistakes so help us out help us get the word out and uh, until next time see ya